What got you there with got you got you? What got you there with Sean Delaney? I'm Sean Delaney, and on this episode of What Got You There, I sit down with Jack Schwager. And Jack is the author of some of my favorite books around financial markets, and it's the Market Wizard series books. And what he's done over the past 30 years is he sit down with some of the legendary traders and investors of all time and extracted the timeless wisdom. Now, what's great about that is these aren't only applicable lessons to investing. These are applicable across all domains of life. And we had this really wide-ranging conversation. We talked more about his process, what he's learned, and what you can learn and use in your own life. So this conversation with Jack D. Swagger is one I think you're really going to enjoy. Jack, welcome to What Got You There. How are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing great. Thanks. I am so excited about this one. You, your work ha, has impacted me for a number of years. But, but I'm wondering, I mean, you've spent decades, three plus decades now, uncovering some of, some of the most insightful wisdom and lessons learned from incredible traders. But is this applicable across other domains in life? If there's someone who has no investing background, doesn't invest at all, do you think they can apply some of the lessons that you've uncovered in their own lives? Yeah, I, was, it's good, I really like the question because it's not one I usually get or maybe I've gotten. And I guess it's the, the core answer is that when you get down to it, what, what is really behind a lot of these points is what's important to success overall, not just, not just in, in trading or invest, investing. There's a lot of overlap. I can think, I mean, I've given lots of talks in my life, but I remember one I gave somewhere out in the middle of the, I don't remember where, some rotary club or whatever. And, and uh, after I give it, and I, I, talks I give are the kind of lessons I learn from talking to these people. And a fellow comes up to me, he says, you know, he's a, he's a pastor and he says, you know, a lot of the points you use were exactly the types of things I did to build my congregation. Now, I don't know how much further you can get away from <laughs> trading to a pastor building his congregation. The point is the elements of success have a lot of overlap almost in whatever you do. And I'll just throw out one example. Um, one of the key things that you find repeatedly in these interviews is a passion, a love for what they're doing. Uh, and you see it in the language. So uh, somebody, I remember Bruce Kovner uh, talking about it being a three-dimensional chess game. Um, uh, Roger, Jim Rogers talked about a jigsaw puzzle of 10,000 pieces, and they're always taking out some pieces and throwing in new pieces. So what are the, what those things are game-like game, game -like analogies, which is kind of conveying that for these people, what they're doing is like a game, something they enjoy. And so that's like a common denominator and goes to your core question, to your original question. How, how would you convey your passion? Do you have this, this game-like approach and quality uh, about what you do? Yeah, my, my main thing is not trading. <laughs> Believe it or not, I trade, but I wouldn't consider it in any way core to my life. It's just a hobby. It's something I do. Um, it, and of course, it's been the focus of, of most of the books I've done. Um, but I guess I... I probably feel would feel something closer to the passion about the writing than I would than I would you know trading. I mean, definitely. So it's not it's not the trading sphere where I where I I get that satisfaction out of. It's it's more it's really if I if I write something and it's and it seems to resonate and and I think it's good myself. Then there's a satisfaction there. I'm wondering then, what element of what you get to do, do you get the most amount of joy in? Is it sitting down with the conversations? Is it coming across new ideas? Is it actually when you write the book? I, I, I'm just intrigued by this. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, the conversations are, they range, okay? So, I mean, I've had conversations which have been great uh, and spent some time, and they can range. Uh, they can range widely. Uh, they can range from as short as an hour or two, uh, which is on the low side, to, to more than a day. And when you're talking to some really interesting people and kind of getting to know them and just, just that conversation itself is, is really, you know, is enjoyable. So certainly that's part of it, but that in the process of, of producing a book is literally maybe 1% at a time, 2% at a time. So really most of the book is a matter of taking, and you can appreciate that doing interviews, right? But imagine you were doing an interview for, that's eight hours long. Um, now, it, it wouldn't work 
you know, listening to it. And it wouldn't work if you, we work even worse if you transcribed it. But what you have to basically do is distill it and then, you know, write, write narrative introductions, summary section, kind of make it molded into a chapter. So that's really where the whole writing process goes in. That's 98, 99% of the work. And so it's taking something that on the, as a transcript is kind of like overwhelming and sort of all over the place and boiling it down into something that reads smoothly and captures the essence of, of that whole conversation. So it's that process that, that is, a, if you do it, if it works, that you can enjoy. That capturing the essence, that distillation process, I, I'm fascinated by this. Uh, I don't know if you ever looked at other people's highlights or notes on different talks and transcripts, and then you're reading it and you realize the, the key elements that, that you looked at were entirely different than theirs. And what I'm saying is I appreciate the key insights and lessons that you're able to extract out. Uh, I'm just wondering how you developed that ability, like to get to the essential nuggets and wisdom. Um, is that just something you, you've, you've developed over time or is that a trait you've always had? I, you know, it's something, I think everybody has certain, you know, certain talents. Um, I, I'm bad at so many things, but I think one thing that I just seem to have a natural, just a natural ability for is taking, taking something and molding it in a way that kind of, even a layman can understand. Um, and, uh, and that extracting process, I think it's, uh, well, people often say, hey, you're a great interviewer. And I tell them really, I'm a lousy interviewer. I'm a great editor. So um, it's not, what I'm doing that's good is really getting the good stuff and mold, you know, when I say molded, because the way we speak does not transcribe to the written page. So when I do it, when, when I'm using these interviews, if I can get verbatim, that's a freebie. That's great. You know, I get a verbatim of something that's good that I want to use. That word for word is excellent, but most people do not speak. And I, I mean, I'm talking about even brilliant people do not speak in a way that looks good on the written page. You know, we'll go off on and I, I myself am part of that as well. We'll go off on multiple tangents. We won't finish sentences. We'll sometimes use the wrong word, um, sometimes have the wrong facts. So I'll give you a good example. Um, one of the interviews I did, um, uh, Michael Platt, who's a London hedge fund manager, uh, basically he gave this interesting example about his psychological, he was trying to make a point how what we remember is faulty. And it's, it's a well-studied thing in, in psychology. And there's a famous experiment where people look at something and in some cases there's a stop sign and in some cases did not, you know, but basically he was using this as an example of how people misremember what, what they see and how we, and how we remember them and then implying it to trading in this case. But you know, so I went back and after the interview, uh, I actually went and read the paper and he had certain facts wrong. I mean, I don't expect him to know verbatim. So I fixed those, okay? so. You know, that's a simple example of where I'm deliberately not using exactly what he said because I knew what he what he wanted to say, but in this particular case, some of the numbers are wrong or some of the, the exact facts are wrong. But the basic point was was correct. So that's that's but things like that come up all the time besides the grammatical issues, besides uh, the same type of topic coming up. I may talk to somebody talking about a topic and two hours later in a conversation, the same topic comes up. So it's really messy if you kind of had it all separated. You want to consolidate it. And the order you discuss things sometimes doesn't work well. It works much better if you shuffle it. So anyway, that's the that's that's all part of the process. And it, I, I think what makes it work, and I use this, this goes to for those people who are interested in writing overall. And this is my advice sometimes people ask me about writing. So my, my advice basically is. You do, my, my first draft is usually pretty good, but you do your first draft. And I use an analogy, it's like you have to clear a field. So first you clear the big boulders. Okay, and once you clear the big boulders, you see, hey, there's a bunch of rocks here. And you gotta go through it again, you clear the rocks. And once you clear them, oh, there's some smaller rocks. 
and you clear them. And then there are, you know, pebbles. You got to get the field completely clear, but you don't see the pebbles in the first time you're doing it. You have to trip over it. And the, you can only trip over it once you get rid of the more obvious things that don't work. So I think what makes it work is just multiple, multiple drafts each time fixing what wasn't obvious before until you can read the whole chapter aloud and not trip over anything. Your, your ability to convey ideas coming to light right there. I, I take it, you're, you're just this explorer. You, you seem to be voraciously curious ba based on what I've discovered within the books. I'm wondering, th does this process come out in your everyday life, even when you aren't working specifically on a book? Like, how are you extracting out key lessons in other domains as well and other things you're reading or listening to? Well, you know, I think curiosity is a, uh, that's a good, that's a good, you know, that's, that's, that's a good point. Um, and I think I am just by virtue of what I'll, you know, I'll read books on science, I'll read books on math, I'll read books on politics, I'll read books, you know, lots of different areas. Uh, and I think that's part of curiosity. And I'm trying to remember where, uh, I'm trying to remember where I heard it or read it. Uh, I'm just not coming to me immediately, but someone made the good point, and hopefully I'll remember uh, in our conversation, made this good point about, um, about, Curious, you know, how curious people react differently. So, and the question was like, you, you're given uh, four topics on, on let's say climate change, right? And it's a question of, you know, in one case it's, you know, in one case it's, it's you know, for climate change and it just supports the conventional. In one case, it's it's against climate change and it, um, and it has the opposite. Uh, but, but there's cases where your view doesn't match what the article is. It's like surprising. So um, there's an article of, you know, uh, climate, uh, if it sounds like a scientific, you know, like uh, some scientific reason, let's say, or argument of why the climate change argument is overstated. So you know, I was asking which, 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 which article would you be most attracted to or most likely to read? And in my case is, I'm a total believer in climate change, have been for a long time, but the article that purports to have some sci some scientific explanation of why it may be not, not as bad or to some counterforce, I'll read that to see, hey, is there something here I don't know? So when I heard that, um, and I think I wish I could remember the source, I said, hey, yeah, that's right. That's I would go to that article. Now I might read an article also that conveys can, can you know is the same way as my thinking that why why are the problem of time child might read that. But what's most interesting to me is a purportedly scientific article of why arguing the opposite thing. So I think, and 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 the the the, the point of this uh, that this this person was making was that curious people will do that. They'll they'll be attracted to an argument that is counter to their to their you know belief. And so I think that is the and so I I took that as well. Yeah, I guess maybe I am on the on the curious side. I, I could be off on this. That that story, I almost feel like it might have been written um, in Adam Grant's recent book, Think Again. I feel like he might have brought uh, up that specific example. You know, uh, I don't, it might have been, I might have listened to a podcast from Adam Grant, I'm not sure. I forget which, you know, like I say, I listened to, I listened to multiple podcasts and it may have been, it may have been, with, you know, I don't remember. Yeah, one of the things you bring up, though, is that ability to, to change your mind. I'm wondering how you're able to explore your own deepest held assumptions and then if there's better information, how do you change on that, right? Like that's not easy being able to change our deepest health assumptions. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I, I, I like to believe that I am willing to change my mind. I do, you know, I'm trying to think of examples. Um, yeah, but if, if I have evidence that contradicts, you know, contradicts what I believe, I'd like to think that I'm, I'm willing to, to accept that, you know, as, uh, as okay, you know, this, I, I had this wrong. Um, you know, I, I'd like to believe that, you know, I, I feel I'm somebody who, who will go by evidence, not by, not by what I want to be true. In fact, one of the, of the, of the scores of trading lessons that I have in my books, um, and it doesn't, but one of the things that's come up, one of the came up in one of the interviews, and I'm paraphrasing, the person said, you know, to be a good trader, you have to do, um, you have to react to what you know to be true, not what you want to be true. 
And, um, and the idea there being that, you know, if you're really good at this, at the game of trading uh, and you have lots of experience, there'll be situations where your experience tells you that something, the market is good, more likely to go in a way, or maybe your position is wrong. Now maybe, and if you're holding the opposite position, it's not what you want to believe, but you have to go with what you, as he said, what you know to be true, not what you want to be true. And, uh, and I'd like to think that I have that philosophy just in general. Yeah, if you're if you're making a trade on hope, <laughs> I don't know. If that's the best strategy. You might want you might want to question that. Uh, I'm just wondering overall. I mean, 30 plus years. How did the first book come to be in the late oh. 80s? Yeah, so that first book, um, I actually had the idea for several years before I ever ever wrote it. Why didn't you so, act on it? Uh, well, it was a cat. It was a catalyst. But what happened basically is, uh, most people think my first book was the Market Wizards book because that was the that made that made like a big splash. The first, the original one. Um, and, uh, you know, became a bestseller and all that. But I had actually written about the, before I wrote that book, about five years earlier, I took, I took a sabbatical. I was a, a director of research in, in derivatives. And I felt there wasn't a good book on futures, on the futures markets. And I thought that I could write something better than existed. So I took a sabbatical. I, you know, this is, it took a tremendous amount to work. It, it was like a 750 page book. And this is pre PC days. Uh, you know, in charts I had to do on graph paper and have, you know, it was like a real, it was a tremendous amount of work. I, and I didn't have like, if I was doing calculations, like regressions, I was doing them by, you know, the calculator. So it was a lot of work besides the writing. And I never wanted to do that again. I, I thought I ended up, unfortunately, not listening to myself. But, uh, but that was my first book. And for an analytical book, it did pretty well. And I got approached by a publisher who wanted me, uh, invited me to lunch. And he said, you know, we like this book. And we want to do a whole series of, of analytical books, one on, one in each market. We want you to be like, you know, editor in chief of the, of the project. I said, you know, no thanks. I, you've done it, been there. And I just want to do more mass audience book. I didn't want to do another book that, that requires, you know, a lot of work and you really have a built in small audience to begin with. So I said, I have this idea and it's, and I had the idea that, gee, wouldn't it be like a fun to go across the country and interview the best traders and kind of pick their, pick their brains and it will be a fun project and it'd probably be an interesting book. And I told him, and I had the, even the title, I don't remember where I had the title from, but I, uh, I don't know, if I came up with, my wife came up with it, I don't remember, but it, you know, the Market Wizards title. So I said, well, here's this idea. And he's like, great, why don't you do it? So at the time I'm a research director, which is more than a, you know, eight hour job. And it's a full-time job, more than a full-time job itself. That's why I never. That's why I hadn't done it, but I had the catalyst, and I didn't want to do it, so I ended up doing it nights and weekends, and uh, uh, and that's how the first book came came about, and um, you know. Uh, well, I mean, taking on on this massive project to write a book, I mean, it had to be more than this is going to be fun. Like, what were you trying to understand and just just accomplish, even with that, to to put in that amount of effort and work? Yeah, I, I just really wanted to understand my basic. I had a couple of basic goals. One goal was to understand what is the difference between these people and and all the other people, you know, the mass masses, yeah. you know, who you know, are totally unsuccessful, and these few, and these this handful who are enormously successful. What what is it about their thinking, their traits, their makeup? You know, what separates them from everybody else? Uh, so that was kind of the core thing I was trying to get at, um, and I thought I'd learn, you know, improve myself. By, by talking to them. And the other thing is I, I had, uh, um, and there's a book called Reminiscence of a Stock Operator, which is a famous book that uh, written by uh, Jesse Lefevre back in the 1920s. He was, he was the, the protagonist in the book is Jesse Livermore. Jesse Livermore. Um, I read that book and, and, it, and it's way back, whole times, bucket shops, I mean, nothing to do I should say nothing to do, but kind of very different than even in the markets back when I first wrote Market Wizards, but certainly way different than today. But the thing about that book is it's still, I read it 65 years later, and it was still very relevant to what was needed to succeed. You know, the lessons were very, very relevant and, and timely. And so my goal when I wrote Market Wizards was I had in mind, gee, I want to write it, I want to do a, 
my, my book is very different than Reminiscences, the structure, the format, but I, my goal was to write a book that 65 years later would still be relevant. So those were the two goals I was basically working with. Funny enough, you, you mentioned Reminiscence of a Stock Operator. I actually, I actually reread that about three weeks ago. Um, oh, and if you're reading between the lines enough, yeah, there, there are some incredible lessons that are just as applicable yeah. today. Uh, obviously, much different uh, in terms of how he's actually executing. But yeah, that, that was a great, enjoyable read. Was there just one of those, those interviews early for you that just fundamentally changed you or just had a profound impact? Uh, there, there were there were interviews that you know changed the way I trade or or think about trading, uh, but I wouldn't say that was profound profound in my life changes. Uh, but I guess the most the most important things that I got uh, was a better sense of how important risk management was to the trading and then also to the investment process. Um, where, whereas I like most people. We're just totally focused on how you trade or or when you trade or yeah without really thinking about about the risk side you know and, and what i understood after the first book it certainly got reinforced in every subsequent market was the book i did is that the risk management is not secondary it's actually fundamental and primary and to be successful you you, you must have that established no matter what your methodology is. So, so to me, and, and there's, a, there's one particular line that comes up in the first Market Wizards book, and it, it occurred in a Bruce Kovner interview. And uh, I, I often say, if, if I was asked, you can give advice to traders, but you could only use 10 words. Um, I know what those 10 words would be. And it's, and I, and it's, a, it's a sentence that Bruce Kovner had, had said, and he said, I know where I'm going to get out before, or know where you get out before you get in. And, uh, and the importance of that is, I mean, in multiple levels, first of all, if you do that, then, it, then you establish risk management right at the out, onset of every, of every trade. Moreover, you, you eliminate the emotionality because you make the decision right at the onset. You don't have to kind of agonize, oh, this is going against me. Do I get out? Do I give it more time? But if you make that decision before you put on a trade, then you, know, you don't have that emotional turmoil, which usually ends up leading people to make wrong decisions because our emotions are very poorly attuned to correct decisions. And, and the other thing is, is there's one thing you have before you put on the trade that you immediately lose once you put on a trade, and that's objectivity. So before you put on the trade, you can think clearly, where should this market not go if I'm right? What am I willing to risk if I'm wrong? And you make that rationally and you make it logically, not emotionally. So that's why I consider it like kind of that one line embeds so much trading wisdom and so much solid advice uh, that I say, you know, it was important to me. It, and it came up in other interviews, you know, maybe with different words with the same lesson. But I would say that was certainly was uh, altering to me in a, in, in, in a scope of trading and that world. Whether it changed my life, I could, uh, probably not, but you know. But it, 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 might, it might not change your life, but we'll, but we'll take it. That's, that's an incredible piece of advice right there. One of the things you bring up, though, is, is around that objectivity and that emotional control. I mean, this is one of the, the key factors. I'm, I'm just wondering how you think about that balance, right, between the the mindset of someone, the attitude, the emotional control versus more of the quantitative factors that, that go into this. How do you think about that and what have you uncovered? Yeah, so I think this is emotional control and psychology overall and various aspects of it is like so integral to, to every Market Wizard book I did. And particularly this is my latest one I did, Unknown Market Wizards. Yeah. Uh, it comes up in, in sort of almost core uh, themes within these chapters where these traders uh, focus so much on self-examination and control of emotion and focus and calming of their, uh, of their, their, uh, to calm their emotions. And, and basically like almost, I, is one trader, not only does he keep notes in every trade he does, it, it's not just the fact he keeps notes 
you know, he can bring out a binder with thousands of pages on every trade he's done, and what he thinks, what he thought, and all that. But he actually records what his emotions were, that, you know, when he took the trade. How do you feel? He keeps a spreadsheet. He keeps a spreadsheet with, with columns which have different emotional aspects. And any, every day he fills that spreadsheet out with X's on any emotional mistake he made. At the end of the week, he reviews it. So, uh, you know, another trader talks about like before every major trade, how he'll, he'll do, he'll meditate, he'll calm himself down, he'll get in an extreme focus state. So it's, it's both physical almost, as well as a mental process and an analytical process, all, all focused to, to, to get emotions um, under control, understood, and so they don't, they don't impede uh, with the trading. And, uh, and like I say, so, so it's like these psychological aspects are, are critical. I, I sometimes will say not facetiously that people think I write books about trading, but they're really more books about psychology. And I think if you go through the chapters, a lot, a lot of these chapters, you'll see that occurs over and over. Yeah, that, that was certainly prominent uh, in your most recent book, Unknown Wizards. Uh, I, I'm wondering, I, I don't know if this is something that's just gotten more attention over the past few years, the, the psych psychology and a lot of the work that Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman have done that have really brought this to light. If you're going back in, within your first book, do you think those core themes were just as, as present? Like, were they doing breathing exercise? Were, were they meditating? Or was yeah. this just not getting as much thought at the time? Uh, you know, it, it, I don't recall offhand, if, it can, like you say, this most recent book, it really comes out very explicitly. Uh, I don't recall necessarily in that first book that that was the case, although there were lots of elements of psychology that that did come in, you know, that, that did, did come into play. Um, I can think from the second book, which, which I did only two years later, the first book, I can think of one interview in particular which was very good on this emotional aspect. And that was by, with Bill Eckhart, um, who was, uh, who originally was Richard Dennis's partner. And people may be familiar with the story about the turtles, kind of famous story about uh, they had a bet. And uh, Bill Eckhart, you know, uh, Richard Dennis said, you could teach anybody to trade uh, successfully. And, and Eckhart, Eckhart, by the way, is kind of a mathematician by background, thought that you couldn't. And, um, and they had the bet, so they put this, Ad in the Wall Street Journal uh, near the end of the year, looking you know for twenty traders, and they and they just said you know we'll train them and whatever. And they were looking when they were looking at the all the resumes they got, they weren't looking for they didn't want people with trading experience. They were looking for like chess masters and poker players and this type of thing. They were looking for people who excelled in things but not necessarily had familiarity trading. Anyway, so they picked twenty people and then they did the same thing one more year, and a lot of those people went on. Uh, at least to initial success, some are still still successful over the long run, and so that was a firm. So he was one of the he was he and Bill Richard Richard Dennis everybody knows, but he was the other half of that equation, and he was a he's a CTA on his own right. Now he had this wonderful point which I really like, and he said that, and this is this is we have behavioral economics now, and you know and uh, Kahneman and Tversky and. Uh, um, and Thaler and, uh, you know, other people who've, you know, who've kind of made, made this in more academic ways. But this was early on. And so this is before, this is, I guess that maybe there was a beginnings of behavioral economics, but this was early on. But he understood and he said that we, you know, we as humans have evolved so that our instincts will lead to worse than random decisions. And the keys is worse than random. He's, so I tell when I give a talk and I use that particular line, I say, well, yeah, you kind of all are thinking about, oh yeah, the cliche uh, story, you could take a monkey, have the monkey throw darts at, at a page of quotations and the monkey will do as well as the professional traders. And I'm saying what Eckhart is saying, I mean, that's not what he's saying. He's saying the monkey's gonna do better because the monkey is not inhibited by our human emotions, which are all, kind of evolved to make the wrong decision. So his point is we've evolved to seek comfort as humans and the markets will not pay off for doing the comfortable thing. I mean, a comfortable thing is like example, if a market's running up like crazy and you've missed a part of it, you're scared, 
you oh I have this my this neighbor's making money on this and this neighbor's making you know say the internet stocks in the late nineties and finally say oh I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be the only one who does make money and then you buy it at some ridiculous price and you you know that's kind of made, once you buy maybe it feels good goes up a little bit of course at the end of the story is really, you end up losing all your money but at the time you make the decision it feels good or if you're in a position that just is wrong and you can't admit it to yourself and you just think you know, all right I'll give it another day I'll give it another day and you keep on losing but every time you say I'll give it another day it feels comfortable because you still have hope and so a lot of these things that we do as humans that are instinctive are just wrong and so that's like a good example from one of the two early books that was purely about psychology and emotion and how it, it, it is uh, sort of harmful to, to successful trading. It, within all the books, is, is there, let's call them a cyborg that you walked away and you were like, this person just is not human, how they can control their emotions. Was there anyone like that for you? Oh yeah, I mean, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, that, that occurred. I mean, some people, some people, um, yeah, like I'll give you a great example, Marty Schwartz. Um, <laughs> Marty Schwartz, and this is like totally unbelievable. I mean, he couldn't keep this up, but when I had interviewed him, he had put together his track record because he was thinking managing outside money. He ended up not wanting to do it or whatever. Forget exactly what happened. But, you know, he had like literally, and, and this is, I, I know hard to believe, but he also, he entered contests, trading contests during that period. And the trading contest also, he did this. He, was, he made like 25% per month you know, for over a 10 year period, which is like crazy. And people will say, well, that's impossible. It would compound to a ridiculous amount. Well, the point was he didn't compound it. He would take $400,000 and like turn it into a million in like four months and then pull the profits out and put it to T-bills. So it was, and that was because his father went through the depression and it kind of instilled in him a fear of things going wrong. And so he was conservative in that score. So, and of course, if he had tried to compound it, he could, it wouldn't work. I mean, he would have gotten too big. Yeah. He was, you know, he had to keep his size small enough so his approach worked. But he, he did this incredible record. Now, uh, he, so he was somebody who was extraordinarily successful. Uh, however, he had, to, he had a temper. I mean, you know, I think that the running joke was that if you had, I think the, his longest, he tried hiring an assistant. I think the longest any assistant lasted with him was like three weeks or something like that. So, um, <laughs> he and he just suffered no he suffered no fools he suffered he just was he was he had a temper um and he could yeah we argued in fact in that first interview we argued um and I, and then some of that some of those arguments are in are in the chapter so he, there's an example of somebody who was extremely successful yet I wouldn't say he was he was very far from calm, you know. Well, we'll talk about that, right? You, you mentioned that the son of a father went through the depression. So those influences, this was his own unique style. I'm, I'm thinking about how like that authentic self, how that person, their their style of investing lines up most with who they are. Is that something that you've uncovered that everyone's different, but they're doing from like their deepest state? Um, is that what you found or am I just wrong with that? No, I don't know. I mean, in, in that case, you know, it's, I mean, there's a direct line between between his, his, you know, his parental influence and what he ended up doing. Um, you know, I, I don't know if that's kind of a common theme beyond there. Um, I know people's going, somebody like Thorpe, who's a brilliant, you know, maybe the most brilliant person I ever interviewed at Thorpe, um, grew up, he, well, he grew up during the depression uh, and uh, from a very poor area, um, but, integral to him was kind of educated. He went to a high, you know, his high school wasn't very academically, you know, challenging. He kind of taught himself physics in high school and he, he managed to get a scholarship to, to one of the California universities. But that, ex, that the need to kind of self-educate himself um, and his, I guess, whole direction into physics and math, which ultimately led to, to what he, you know, to the approaches he used in trading and stuff. Uh, so that, I guess it all grew out of that early experience. It's another example. Yeah. Ed, Ed Thorpe is one of those people. I, I am like genuinely just absolutely <laughs> maniacally obsessed with just, he, he is so fascinating to me. It's beyond belief, but you mentioned he, he probably is the smartest person you've ever sat down with. I'm wondering like, what about that meeting with him? Did you walk away saying that? Well, 
the accomplishments of this man are really extraordinary. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, just a, just a few of them, right? So he started out, well, first of all, here he comes from nowhere uh, and, and he kind of gets, you know, to self-educate, gets into a good university, going for his PhD in physics, writing his thesis, decides he doesn't know enough math. Starts taking graduate courses in math, gets a PhD in math, never goes back and completes his physics thesis. So he literally could, you know, he could have been a double, you know, PhD in physics and math. Goes on then and uh, decides that he wants to, he wants to figure out how to beat the casinos, which sounds impossible. I'll take something like, like roulette. So if somebody says, well, they beat roulette. Well, you say, well, that's, you know, probability wise, that's crazy. You can't beat roulette. Except <laughs> his solution is not the stupid things like looking for sequences in a random number, in a random process, which is a fool's game. But his thing was, hey, let's use Newtonian physics to, uh, to figure out, you know, what part of the quadrant of the wheel or what part of the octet of the wheel is the most likely to land probability wise, which has to do with measuring the velocity at one point and then the physics take over and you figure out where it's, you know, most likely to land. And to do that, uh, well, he teamed up, uh, 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 I'm forgetting the other famous physicist who's kind of known as the, the information, uh, the father of information theory. Um, I just the name slips me. It's, but, I'm going anyway. blank as well. What, one of the great parts that you bring up about being the casino, though, is he reached out to all of the smartest people he knew, and everyone was like, "That's crazy, you can't do it." Yeah, and he yeah, goes, you know what? There's well, my op opportunity. But that is why I'm going to go after that. The other physicist this was a gadgeteer, as we you know, you know, like like gadgets and stuff like that, and and so together they and this is in the '60s. Together they they built a mini computer that could like fit, you know, fit in the shoe or something. Like, and think about this. This is like, I remember I was in, in, in a senior year uh, in, in college in, in 1969. And I remember using, it was a mainframe that filled a room to run a simple thing. And these guys, you know, five, six years earlier had, had actually invented a mini computer. I mean, that's so far in advance. And, and the way it would work, you know, so there was one, he would sit there, you know, uh, one of them would, would like, you know, run the computer, uh, and make believe they were counting cards but run the computer. And then he had a headset or some air plugs what they, that he could hear. They had an octet like a do re mi, which would indicate which, which, uh, which where it would land. Anyway, they came up with something that had a 40% edge over the casinos. Then he figured out a way to beat the casinos at blackjack by, by he understood that even though every game in the casino is negative edge, that if you bet more when the probabilities or more in your favor in blackjack when there's less picture cards out that you could take a negative edge turn into a positive edge. And he wrote this, and he eventually kind of made it public. He wrote this book, Beat the Dealer, which you know became a, be a really worldwide bestseller. Basically, it changed the way casinos operate. Uh, the casinos had actually meetings, what they should do with this math professor. Uh, there was actually in, the, in my chapter, I have a story about an attempt on his life um, so that, that he did that. Then he went on to, 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 he decided that was too much, that was not the way, that was too much effort. And he went on to markets and he figured out how to, how to beat markets. And he came up, he was the first person to come up with a, with a, uh, uh, a market neutral. Uh, well, actually he figured out, he, this is really uh, important. He figured out the, the, the mathematical equivalent of the Black-Scholes model, which is, the super famous academic paper that explains how options, uh, how to price options and kind of changed option trading, everything else. But he had kind of was using that years before the paper was published. And he didn't publish it because he was, he, he just had a money machine going. And then he figured out uh, very, he was the first hedge fund uh, to use convertible law, the first mark, statistical law. Lots of these hedge fund techniques, he was the first person to figure out. So it just goes on and on. This is one guy. Uh, so just, and maybe the best part of it is, you, you'd think of all of that, he'd have, he'd be kind of a little bit self, you know, inflated, but he's just, you know, he's just not, he doesn't make you feel, he doesn't talk down to you. He, he doesn't make you feel like you're inferior. Uh, he taught, you know, he's just like a good guy. So the combination of somebody who has achieved so much and is so brilliant yet doesn't, doesn't get distorted by it. Um, I, I, I particularly was impressed with.
Yeah, he's a truly fascinating character. You mentioned his ability to uncover his edge. I'm wondering what you've discovered uh, around these different traders actually uncovering their edge. The, the reason I'm asking this is so many times our greatest strengths, we're, we're almost blinded to. It takes other people to uncover them for us. How self-aware are most of these traders in really understanding what their unique ed edge is? They, they have to understand it. So um, a couple of points here. First of all is that you know, there are two, two essential things to, to, to trade, to, to trading. So, I mean, it's more than two, but, but two core things. I talked about one being risk management. The other one is risk, well, risk management by itself is not enough, you know, because you could have great risk management um, and, and you, if you don't have an edge, you know, you're still going to lose. I mean, you know, take your best, you know, in, in fact, the odd thing is that if you don't have an edge, your best strategy is is the exact inverse of risk management. So say if you're going to play roulette, you have $1,000, okay? If you would ask 100 mathematicians, you know, what's your best strategy if you're going to bet $1,000 on roulette? They should all tell you the same thing. You know, pick red or black, hard or even, whatever, put the whole thousand down, you know, one time, win or lose, walk away. Now your, your edge is still negative, but your smallest negative edge is, is if you just bet once. So if you, so, which is the exact opposite of, a risk management. Risk management is you don't want to lose very much. So if you don't have an edge, the point is risk management can't save you at all. So you need to you need two things. You need the edge and you need risk management. Now, to, to, to have an edge, everybody has their own methodology, and that's part of it. So people have to develop a method that that works for them, that, that is in tune with their beliefs. Um, you know, so somebody, I mean, I've, I've interviewed traders who who have complete disdain for for let's say technical analysis. They say, oh, it's a bunch of mumbo jumbo. It's just garbage, you know, and they're just 100% fundamental. And I've, I've interviewed traders uh, like Paul Schwartz, for example, I remember his lines, I, I spent 10 years using fundamentals, lost money every year. I got rich as a technician. So you've got mm -hmm. both extremes. And the point is what works for one doesn't work for another, but they each, each of these traders found a method that resonated with their inner beliefs there there was uh, that was uh, compatible and amenable to who they were and uh, and it just worked work for them and it's not going to be the same in fact by definition it's going to be different for everybody so uh, yeah I'm wondering about this one of the things that really, really impressed me is some of these traders, we think about failure as kind of one of those essential building blocks to developing over time, but some of these people went completely bust. And I'm just wondering what you, what you uncovered about people who went completely bust, were able to rebound and then have success again in the future. Yeah. So that was just one of the, I guess if you ask me what one of the biggest surprises were when I did this book was how many of these people who were phenomenally successful actually completely blew out and sometimes more than once. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> And I think the classic chapter on this, is, but it's not by far not the only one, was the very first chapter of Market Wizards. I, it was maybe it was my favorite chapter in the book and maybe one of the favorite chapters I ever did, but a fellow called Michael Marcus, who was a very shy, well, is, I guess, a, you know, a guy who never gave any interviews. Nobody would know who he is. I happen to know him personally. Uh, yeah, we actually met when I took my first job on Wall Street as an analyst, he was leaving the analyst position to become a trader. And uh, I was taking his position and he was cleaning out his desk when I came in, we talked. He was still in New York for a couple of years. We used to get together every few weeks. I kind of knew him and he finally agreed to do the interview. But his story of all the failures he did, I just had to one place say, well, didn't you just think that maybe you weren't cut out for this? And he just like said, no, I just, he uses an analogy, uh, of uh, like Fiddler on the Roof, where the protagonist is on the roof talking to God, like, and it's sort of like saying, am I really this stupid or can't, and he just, you know, got this the sense, no, you can do it. And so I would say there's this kind of, this kind of two lessons there is, is one, early failure does not necessarily imply long-term failure. You know, uh, of course, sometimes it does, but, but not necessarily, because a lot of these people did have early failures. Uh, and the second thing is that these people had just an incredible self-confidence and drive to be able to come back again and again. So that, that not, not, not many people are able to do that. You know, many people would just give up. Yeah. And so it's that drive. With Michael, did he change his strategy 
like, or, or was the original strategy the same in the end? He just, it could have yeah. been due to luck or timing or whatever it is. Every story that he had, had to do with, uh, almost every story, had to do with, with a, a failure of risk management. Hmm. You know, so uh, he had all his eggs in one basket type of thing. And, and so that was, so learning that the hard way, uh, that, that kind of made him then much more cognizant of the risk management side. So that was one part of it. Uh, and, and another part was he just learned better how to trade. Uh, uh, it, it's just a matter of experience. So it was a combination of those things. Uh, the thing though, he wasn't the same trader when he became successful as he was initially. So initially he would fail, try something else, fail. Then he begin to get a methodology and then be right. And then just bet everything on, bet the farm, so to speak. And then, and then something would happen, you know? So uh, like, for example, uh, there was a year, there was a corn blight and he kind of had the instincts early on that this, this was going to be a big thing. So he bought a bunch, you know, he used, on margin, he just bought a lot of corn contracts and he sort of, he took his few thousand dollars that he had and he multiplied it to 50 and then he borrowed money, more money, some more. And then there was like uh, rumors that it was going to be happening again a second year. And he sort of took all his money and put it into grain contracts. Not only that, he borrowed money from his mother and he came, he came from a relatively lower middle class, I wouldn't say poor to middle, lower middle class family. So this, his mother didn't have much money. And he took her money and he, he ended up, he said, one morning there was a story that hit the, I don't know, it was the Wall Street Journal, one of, one of the papers, and the story read, more blight on the Chicago Board of Trade than in the fields of Iowa, something along that line. And the market went limit down and limit down, and he lost it all. And it's because he had all, you know, he just, but he had to get through those phases. And of course, you know, once he became successful, he, he wouldn't be doing stuff like that anymore. One of the things you kept bringing up there uh, is just his ability to learn. And that's one of the key themes, right? Like these guys are just absolute learning machines. What have you uncovered about their ability to learn? And of course, there, there's multiple things they're learning. They're, they're learning better mindsets to attack. Um, they're just learning from a wide breadth of different industries and domains. What have you uncovered about their ability to learn? Yeah, they, you, they have to, you have to adapt. You have to be willing to change. Uh, you know, that's why I think People who are dogmatic in general would make lousy traders. So I think you have to be able to, to admit you're wrong, to, uh, to be very flexible, to reverse your position, not to hope you're right, but also to, to change, even to change your method. And if I just use the recent, the recent uh, book as an example, and there's a couple of good examples there, but maybe the best example is a fellow by the name Marston Parker, who, who was the, actually ends up being there aren't, there aren't that many purely systematic traders that I have, usually the more discretionary. But in this last book, there's one purely systematic trader, and he's the one. And so he's an ex-software guy. So everything he always did, and he fell into trading just because it left him this software development, led him to an interest in developing trading systems. And so he kind of developed this, this set of systems, and he traded it for a number of years. He had like a he worked for a software company that got acquired. He got like a million dollars plus and he used that as a stake. So he, he, he traded for a number of years, you know, quite successfully using these systems. And then, you know, then he noticed one year, the first few months, it just stopped working. And he kind of hypothesized that, well, the problem is that he's waiting to the end to the close. The market has just gotten quicker. People are, are reacting quicker because of computerization. And he realized he had to make the decisions. He had to change the systems. So it executed intraday or earlier in the day, estimating what the what the volume would be, let's say at the end of the day, based upon say the volume, you know, in the first, you know, first segments of time. And so he changed it. But since he's a software guy I'm sitting in his office, he's he's got every system, every combination of systems he ever traded. I said, well, what happened to that original system? So or combination of systems. He said, oh, yeah, I could bring that up. And he clicks, gets us, clicks the screen a couple of times and it brings it up. <laughs> It's this wonderful chart. It's like goes straight up, reaches a peak and goes straight down. So from the point and to this day, it never stopped going down. So from, from a, you know, F, the top was like, when he noticed it stopped working. And from that point on, 
it lost money every single year. So that's like kind of a beautiful example of where somebody who's earned a living trading would have been wiped out had he not had the flexibility to realize that the markets had changed, his approach wasn't working, he needed to change. So that, that's like one example. There's, there's lots of others. There's like Peter Brandt, who's a classic chart analyst. Although most of his important messages have to do not so much with charts as they have to do with risk management. But a lot of the, he noticed that a lot of the earth patterns that used to work because of chart analysis became too popular, they stopped working. So he no longer pays attention to that because uh, these patterns, yeah, they may have worked 10, 15, 20 years ago and before, but they've stopped working. So yeah, he had to adapt. So he he continues to use certain patterns that work, but not, but has dropped a lot of others. So you, you have to learn, you have to change, and uh, you know that's key to, to staying successful. Well, one of the things that you brought up uh, that just piqued my interest was around the subconscious. And I'm almost somewhat surprised to, to hear different traders talk about this. I would love to, to hear your thoughts on this overall after being able to hear this from different people and just what you've analyzed. Sure. So, you know, people talk about intuition and trading. I'll say it's some kind of a thing. And some people, and many, I think the common, common response or reaction to that is that it's some sort of, you know, odd, oddball thing, you know, yeah, occult or whatever. You know, it doesn't mean it's illogical, you know, all of that. And, and that's kind of wrong. So basically intuition, the way I see intuition, and, and a lot of these traders have, you know, the intuition, they just kind of, you know, always have a sense of when the market's going to go in a way. And they can't always verbalize why or even know why. But to me, the explanation of intuition that works is that these people have a lot of experience. They've watched markets for for, for a decade or two decades or whatever. They, you know, been in tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of trades. There's just a wealth of experience they've had in experience, you know, in experience. And, and not all, it's not always at the, they don't can't always associate what it is about it, but sometimes I'll see something. You know, let's say let's say if somebody is a chart or something, they may there may be something about the market, the way the market's acting, or the, or the way the charts are following something. They may not really not, may not be a particular pattern, but they just sense that the market's going to go one way or the other. And what I see it is is intuition being subconscious experience. Um, and one of the reasons why it's subconscious sometimes. Uh, is because it may be something that you don't want to recognize consciously. Uh, and I'll give you a personal, this, I put this story in the first Market Wizards book, and it's not for the traders, it's actually a personal experience. But this is way back, and uh, I was, uh, you know, I was, I guess I was long the Canadian dollar, and I had a, a you know, I don't know, I, mean, I wasn't even long. I think I, I, I was bullish on the Canadian dollar, but it had run up a bit, and I, you know, I couldn't bring myself to buy it because, hey, I could have bought it a week ago or less, or two weeks ago less. But I, but I was seeing it all and I just felt it was going higher. But I just couldn't, because if I bought it, then I'd be admitting I was, a, I was an idiot for not buying it a week or two earlier. But at one night, I, you know, I had, had the stream and I dreamt that the Canadian dollar just exploded to the upside. And, to, and that was a perfect example. At a conscious level, I couldn't admit, you know, what I kind of knew internally. Um, because it would just be an admission I had really screwed up by not buying earlier. But in my dreams, it came out. Mm -hmm. And I did go in and I did buy it and it did go up, you know, so uh, substantially. So that's a personal example of where, where it, the subconscious came out, you know, in a dream because I couldn't admit to myself. I didn't want to admit it consciously because it would be admitting I was wrong. Yeah, this is one of those topics a lot of people avoid. Uh, I've had some experiences, like like you mentioned with yourself, and it's just I'm fascinated by this the the adaptive unconscious because w through all of our senses we're, we're taking in about 11 million bits per second, and we're only analyzing about 60 of them. So what you mentioned these tens of thousands of trades experiences, I'm I'm just excited for the science, hopefully to catch up at some point uh, yeah. so we can understand this a bit better. W one of the things that I'm so intrigued by and I'm just impressed by and just curious about for you is, is like what's going on behind the scenes? You, you've spent a lot of time over the years. And I mean, you just do like a really good job even just getting these people who are most of the time highly private to share, and then you can bring this to light. Like, what do you do behind the scenes to make you better at your own craft? 
Uh, I don't know what makes me better. I don't think anything behind the scenes, but in terms of getting the people to, to agree to interviews. So um, part of it is that sometimes I, like in that first book, I knew some of the, you know, in order to too, I knew some of the people directly I've met them. So, so that's helpful. Um, but one thing I do is, uh, yeah. and in the first book, I had to go by that and their recommendations and by people believing me. But I, I took this, I basically went, look, hey, and I don't mean this as, as a slam on, on journalists, but I said, look, I'm not a journalist. I'm not like to do an expose. I'm just trying to find truth here. And, and, uh, and I'm not trying to blind, you know, blindside you. Because I have to, it's a hard sell a lot of times, like you say. Uh, why should they give me an interview? Uh, somehow, like I say, a number of these people have never given interviews again in their lives. Uh, and many of them never managed money or wanted to manage money. So there's not a motive there. Um, you know, so the, the reasons they do it could be, uh, could be varied, like from maybe they wanted to do it for one, they want a parent to read the story or a child to read the story or something like that. They may have some motive, you know, that's not monetary. Um, but, but basically still I have to convince them. And one of the things I do behind the scenes is I tell them, look, I'm not going to publish anything until you see it. And uh, I'll let you see it and approve it before it gets published. And uh, I said, if we can't agree on changes, you know, we'll, if the things that you don't want, we don't, or, you know, that if you want changes, and you know, if I'm, if I'm fine with it, that's no problem. If we have a disagreement, you know, we'll hopefully find a compromise. Uh, but b- bottom line, I, I give them, I give them the out that that they they, they have to approve it. Uh, and, and in a couple of cases, that kind of backfired. And, I had a written interview and I couldn't use it, but that's worth the price because I'm sure that, and sometimes there are cases where they had me sign a contract, say, you know, uh, really, I mean, it happened only a few times that I actually signed a contract, but uh, most cases they'll take me at my word. And I think I also have a reputation for, for being somebody who's trustworthy. So uh, that, that has helped. And I think they, in subsequent books, people saw who were in the initial books and like I say, reputational, they might've checked and they said, he's okay and stuff like that. So I think once I had the first book out, it made it, it paved the way to get other people uh, to, to agree to it. Being able to analyze your entire career, is there a lesson that took you a while to learn that now being able to look back at you wish you had learned it immediately and then kind of just implemented that more frequently? Yeah, the, uh, as far as career wise, uh, well, I've done different things, uh, you know, in the writing, I would say no. In the writing, I think my initial instincts worked well, which was always to kind of try to write cleanly and, you know, uh, if it's an analytical book, trying to explain things to people, not assuming that they, they're they quantitative or whatever, you know. Um, and I felt that I did a better job than than uh, a mathematician would do when there's like uh, anything to do anything with math because I had to really understand it myself. And I was much closer to to a general reading audience than, you know, uh, it's the, the famous curse of knowledge. If you know too much, then you then you don't realize what people know. So I felt ironically because I I really was so inferior in knowledge of math. I I felt I could actually did a better job in writing about some of these things than people who had you know a thousand times my knowledge. Um, so that's as far. And, and on the other book, the the uh, more general audience books like the Market Wizard books, there was a matter of kind of shooting for things that were both important to the reader, but were also interesting. So, um, and also trying to use humor when I could. Uh, but I still remember they said my second Market Wizard book, I had an editor and I had various, you know, I try to put humor in wherever I can. And the editor again, I got back the edit the copy and normally my copy is pretty clean and there's not much, it's just more like almost typographical instructions than it is editing changes. Or, or the editing changes are very, very minor and usually improve. Like this last book had a great editor and virtually almost every, every editing change I took. Um, but so she, she, had, uh, she took out every, every humorous line. I said, what the hell are you doing? It was not a, because it wasn't in keeping with the typical investment book they were doing, you know, like, it's not, you know, so, so things like that is, is just knowing the importance uh, of writing something that is interesting, including, and the story, you know, some, 
most people will appreciate it. Occasionally you get somebody said that they just want, they just want the trading advice. They don't want to, well, it's too bad. You know, but I try to write, I'll include anything in a chapter that I think is a good story or is important, but I'll include both. And uh, because I think the story is, makes it a good read, makes it a better read. And I think it also helps understand the people that I'm interviewing. So I think that is, that's instinctive. I wouldn't say that's things I learned. Those are things that were just, just kind of seemed to me natural that, that I should be doing. Um, and as far as the, the learning process, if it comes to something like uh, like trading, I said, you know, there, what I, what, I, what I wish I knew in the beginning would have been the risk management side, which I understood eventually, but uh, that's, but as far as the rest of my career, I wouldn't say there's anything, you know, other than, other than that. Yeah, well, well, speaking of that acquisition of knowledge earlier, you mentioned you, you are curious, you, you read broadly, you're interested in a lot of different things. What outside of trading uh, has captured your attention? Is, um, is, there, is there anything like that over the years? You're like, oh yeah, I, like, I just thoroughly, it might be a book, it might be a person. You're like, oh wow, I, I just couldn't stop myself from going down a rabbit hole here. Uh, not so much in terms of intense uh, things. I mean, I, I'll read books on... Uh, like on various topics um, and, uh, but I wouldn't say anything, you know, just one thing where I've gone really deep and sort of gotten a second expertise in any area. So uh, it's just more things that I find uh, interesting or uh, so I have read like a number of books on, I'm kind of, I, I love books that have to do with um, true adventure type of uh, narratives like, uh, you know, endurance, uh, you know, the famous, the, the Alfred Lansing's book on Jackson uh, Expedition, or one I just recently read, uh, a couple I read recently, A Kingdom of Ice, which is uh, another story about, well, this was when they thought that North Pole, they, at the time, this is back in the uh, 18, around 1860 or 70, whatever, but they thought that the North Pole, that there was some sort of body of water, actually, they were 100 years too early, the way it's turning out with global warming, they're going to be right. But at the time, they, they thought there was a big body of water up there, you know, and they tried to sail to the to the North Pole and got stuck and, you know, got trapped in the ice for a few years. And that whole, the whole story of what happened thereafter. And, and, and they, they're incredible stories because they're true. And what these people did is just extraordinary. Uh, you know, another book along, I read recently, River of Doubt, which is about Teddy Roosevelt, who... Uh, after he lost the third, his third you know, presidential run, uh, went, uh, was a co-leader of an expedition for an unexplored Amazon River. And I mean, we're talking about going down something nobody's ever gone, um, you know, with, with hostile uh, in, indigenous people who, you know, you know, likely to kill you with all sorts of disease and, and you know, all sorts of peril. And, and he literally, he, he was, he was almost dead, you know, on that, on that expedition. And, and people, I mean, it's like a historical aspect people wouldn't necessarily know, but that, that's, I find it's fascinating because it's true. And the grit of these people, what they did is just, you know, especially when it goes into the unknown, nobody's ever been there and everything else. So I find those, those stories, I, 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 I tend to kind of lean to nonfiction just because to me, that's actually a lot more exciting and interesting because it's, not only a great story, but it actually happened. I'm wondering, you just mentioned some of these people going into the unknown. If you could do what you do, great. You know, spend a day, eight plus hours interviewing, sitting down with anyone throughout history. It could be someone alive today. I'm just wondering who you would love spending the day with. Oh, gee. Um, that's a good one. Uh, you know, you think of like a famous scientist or like Einstein, something like that. You know, I I would I, I hesitate to say that because I I just not smart enough to do an interview there or know enough um, as to what people I I you know I, I I nothing comes to the top of my head um, as 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 people that gee I just would love to to interview because um, I've never actually I've never thought about it I never thought about going outside my sphere I I. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have a good answer there. Is, is there someone in this sphere? Is there someone in the markets that you haven't gotten to sit down with? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, thank you. I mean, that's an easy one. There's one person in particular that I, I tried repeatedly, never actually spoke to. I never got through their, their circle of, uh, of assistance or whatever. And that's George Soros. And uh, 
The reason I wanted to, well, I interviewed Stanley Druckenmiller, who, you know, who ran his own hedge fund for 30 years, credible career. I think he did like 30% roughly for 30 years, uh, uh, really one of the best trader investors uh, of, of modern times. And he worked for a while when George Soros was running, uh, when, when, the, when the Berlin Wall came down and the Soviet Union, you know, kind of imploded, he was like in Eastern Europe and Russia trying to, uh, he, had, he was trying to convert those, those economies to, to uh, democracies or influence them in that direction. And um, anyway, that's where his focus was. And he's on carrying by himself in his own background and stuff. So he was, and Druckermiller was running his funds, but so I got that, sorry, through Druckermiller, I tried to get Soros to agree also on my own. And the reason I wanted to interview Soros is because he's truly, you know, maybe, I don't know if he's the best trader of, of, of modern times or ever, but he's certainly in the, in the top 10, you know, and uh, just one of the best ever. And he has a fascinating life story. He's, uh, you know, I think he escaped, he escaped during the Holocaust, I think, uh, from Hungary. I don't know the exact story, but I know he did. And uh, he, uh, you know, came from nothing to be, you know, this credible wealth. He did try, he had his experiences, like I say, in Eastern Europe and Russia, of trying to convert those economies, and everything related to that. Uh, plus, he has all this trading stuff and, you know, the famous story, how he broke the bank in England, but lots of other things. So he, I think he would have been, he would have made a great interview uh, if he would, had been willing to cooperate. And um, so that's a perfect example of somebody I really, really wanted to interview, but just couldn't get to. Yeah, I, I heard from someone that when you reached out to him, the reason he didn't proceed was because he got that back pain. No, no, I'm, I'm making light that Soros used to get back pain uh, when, when he was his subconscious was telling him oh. around certain trades. Well, you heard that he got that when I asked him. No, no, I, I'm totally joking oh, here, Jack. <laughs> oh, oh, no, 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 because no, no, that's that's a son tells that story. It's, it was actually a stomach ache, so you know he he's sort of I think he's saying paraphrasing. I think son said that. You know, when he gets a stomach ache when he's in a position, it's kind of just, he knows to get out, you know. Yeah. It's like, uh... Well, Jack, this has been so much fun. This, is, this has been an honor for me. Uh, your books are something I, I just, um, I mean, just unbelievable wisdom throughout the years. I've been able to pull from, extract from, go back to over and over again. Uh, I want to make sure we, we link the listeners up with you. Where can they stay connected with you? Um, I know you've got a, different, a few different places they can go. Where do you want them going? Well, uh, basically, I have a website, which I have to admit, I'm Kind of got lazy, no longer update, but it's jack at jackschwager.com. Or I'm sorry, uh, not that's jackschwager.com, just my name. Uh, but uh, basically, you know, as far as the books, you know, I mean, they are there, uh, but obviously Amazon or any but I have a seller. Uh, I'm also involved with a startup called Fun Cedar, uh, which is funcedar.com, which has a platform for traders, a free platform of, of performance analytics. And so if traders want to have free analytics on their performance, they can go to frontseater.com. And I guess those are the spots. Great. Well, all those will be linked up in the transcript. But Jack Schwager, I cannot thank you enough for joining us on well, what I, enjoyed, I enjoyed your questions. I figured you'd go some other areas and you did. That's great.